I've come to London South Bank University to meet a group of engineers who are developing fared recumbent bicycles. These human powered vehicles are absolutely insane. They can reach speeds of 80 to 90 miles per hour just off human power. So I want to find out more. I want to find out what these things are actually like to ride. What are the insane engineering challenges that need to be overcome to develop them? And what is the ceiling? What is possible if everything is optimized? Could they break 100 miles per hour? Let's find out. But what is a fared recumbent, I hear you ask? Well, a fared recumbent is basically a bike shaped like a bullet. Fared because it's covered in an aerodynamic fairing and recumbent because that's the rider position inside. By effectively lying down, you can make these bikes around 20 times more aerodynamic than a normal upright bike. But to find out more, I'm going to speak to Barney Townsend, a senior lecturer in engineering and product design at London South Bank University. Barney and his engineering students design and build these incredible machines. Thanks for inviting us down, Barney. The first thing I want to know is how fast can these things go? A world record currently stands at 89.5 miles per hour on a bicycle with a very little amount of material between and, and, yourself and the road. And just to be clear, that's on, that's on the flat as well. It's not like, it's, it's not like downhill um, or, or anything like that. It is just pure like human power. Pure human power on the flat. The course where they uh, hold the uh, World Human Powered Speed Challenge is a five mile long arrow straight road in the northern Nevada desert with less than 1% gradient over the length of the road. So something that stands out, this one has a window so yep. you can see where you're going. This one doesn't appear to have any windows. How, 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 how? <laughs> okay, so that one does have a window, but you're not gonna see much out of it if you look directly through it. If you imagine a postage stamp beyond your feet, with your feet in the way, it's there to have a, uh, a camera in the nose uh, so you can see through the window and then the camera relays that shot back to a, a small screen in front of your face. Right. This bike uh, we're looking at now is 77 from Russell Bridge. Russell chose to remove the window at the front and put his camera on a stalk um, further back on the bike. The air is more turbulent here, so aer aerodynamically there's less of a penalty. Um, and you can see inside that translates the footage down to a camera that hangs right in front of his face, and a screen rather. It's like the inside of like a, a jet fighter or something. It's, it's crazy from the, the various simulations we've done or what we know about top end human power capability, what we think we can do with aerodynamics, we think 93 miles an hour is probably possible. This is why our project is named AIM 93. 93 doesn't sound like a big uh, increment on the current record of 89 and a half. Yeah. But given that it's a um, cubic power law in terms of the power you've got to put in, that yeah. difference is actually a, a country mile. At that stage, it's all in the aerodynamics. Assuming we have a, a relatively consistent top level power delivery from the highest athlete that we can find, the relative proportions of the losses in the drivetrain become much less. So the optimization on that will be as they do in Formula One, they, they, they shape the cockpits around the, the driver, they then bring it all in as closely as they possibly can. Can I try sitting in one of these? Of course. You're a couple of centimetres bigger than me, so you probably won't fit in. It's a bit like getting into a toothpaste tube. Um, I mean, I'm just about in. I don't think this will look comfortable on camera, and I can assure you it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's but, not particularly comfortable for me. It's, it's probably very, very fractionally too small for me, but you could argue that that's ideal. So 74 miles an hour in this, that blows my mind. What sort of power were you having to produce in order to do that? I was doing about 280 watts on the, on the run-up and then about 450 to 500 in the in the final sprint. So recumbent muscles tend to recruit a different group of muscles coming up. So you need to be fit enough to put the power out in the position. And then you need to have lots of, ex lots of recumbent experience because what tends to happen when you start sprinting on a recumbent is that your head moves from side to side, which takes the bike over the road. So you need experience in keeping it steady and, and putting the power out. It's a two lane wide road, but that becomes incredibly narrow when you're doing 70 mile an hour. So tiny variations push you all across the road. There's wind all the way down the course. So you need to be comfortable to keep pushing on the power. Cause if you come off every time you get a sidewind, you just get nowhere down the course. 
In the past, we've run a direct drive system from the front chain ring onto a sprocket in the front wheel. As that moves forwards and backwards, that would be making quite a significant difference in the chain length, which is problematic. Most teams resolve that by using a crossover drive system, drive from the chain ring up to a crossover axle and a secondary chain that is driving almost in the line of the steering system so that when you rotate the steering wheel, you're not applying as much tensioning and untensioning or, or difference in length to the chain itself. We're actually trying to shorten the bike as much as possible. This is one of the reasons behind moving to a 20 inch wheel on the back end, it means we can lie him down much more closely onto it. Yeah, um, well, you can, yeah, you can bring that wheel in much right, right. shorter. But, exactly. So we're gonna be doing a number of power tests to work out exactly what is the optimal position of rider to give him his best power delivery. So this is really important at sort of perfecting first the ergonomics and the rider position before you then decide right we're going to start molding carbon fiber shells which takes a lot of a lot of time a lot of money human hours to to, to do all that yeah so this yeah i can appreciate how this is uh, crucial we have the molds for our old aerodynamics and it's a relatively much shorter process to lay back up into them but testing different construction methods different core materials for light weighting different stiffnesses of different uh, weaves of, uh, of carbon, carbon Kevlar. The balance between weight, protection, stiffness. Another technical challenge is, is tyres and rolling resistance. We know that this is hugely important at, at normal bike speeds, but imagine that these speeds, it's, it's, it's ginormous. So you want the fastest rolling tyre possible. The problem comes when you're using the smaller wheels, which are necessary for the aerodynamics, is trying to find you know, the fastest tyres available is, is a challenge. And another important consideration with tyres and wheels is rotating weight. Now, we've often said how rotating weight doesn't matter. You store the energy in the heavier um, wheel, which then you get back when you stop pedaling or go around a corner or uh, go down a hill. However, Within the context of the land speed record, rotating weight does matter because it is just a, an acceleration up to speed and rotating weight does slow you down whenever you're accelerating. This effort is just an acceleration. How are you gonna be you know, training to, to ride in, in the position and in the recumbent? So it's a lot of uh, power tests uh, so, and VOG max workouts. Uh, as well as strength training. In regards to the type of strength training I'm doing, it's uh, leg press, mainly squats, as well as just body weight exercises to warm up initially. But then it's primarily focusing on those two movements, leg press to isolate my muscle groups and squats to just build up my strength levels. Sounds to me, it's quite similar to like a sort of track pursuiter and, and yeah. how they were training. And it's a similar length effort, isn't it? It's yes. like, that's sort of four minutes yeah, and then a minute exactly. really hard. So what sort of power are you aiming to produce and, and how much harder is it in, in the position? So there's, so recumbent position is so much harder. I'm initially trying to do for the run up around 400 watts with an ultimate sprint of around 500 to 550 watts and that should result in a speed of around 84 to 85 miles an hour. Wow. Yeah. That's nuts. Yes it is. So that's, so, if, so that your goal is 85 miles an hour which that would be um, a, a new British record. Any British record, yeah, that would be. Yeah. The current record stands at uh, 76 miles an hour. My friend Ken has it, so he'll be delighted to hear that you're you're going to beat him. Yeah. <laughs> and what about getting used to actually like riding a recumbent? How how are you doing that? Uh, yeah, so it's mainly doing training in Regent's Park, um, just getting comfortable in the recumbent position. Uh, uh, there's no kidding, uh, going from an upright bike to a recumbent position is quite a lot harder. It's a different set of muscle groups being used. And if you don't get that practice in, you just wouldn't do well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all the best. Thank and you. Um, well, I'll, I'll, well, well, we'll be following your progress. Thank you. And hopefully yeah. you get a new British yep. record. Sure. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this fascinating look at human-powered vehicles as much as I have. The, the engineering complexity of them and all the, the detail of it, it's... Well, it's, it's just so interesting. And big thanks to Barney and his team for, for showing us everything today. And if you want to, well, stay up to date with how they get on when they go to Battle Mountain, well, subscribe if you like this kind of content because I'll be posting some updates in the, in the tech show uh, as and when they happen. And uh, I'll tell you what else I'm gonna do. I'm gonna get, I spoke to Barney just after we left. I'm gonna get some Silka hot melt wax to him in the post because that should save him a few watts in the, uh, in the drivetrain, especially as they have two chains. Anyway. 
I'm gonna, I've got to go catch a, tr a train now back to GCN Megabase. I'll, uh, I'll catch you later. Love you. Bye. <laughs>